Hello everyone and welcome to Cinematic Excrements. And even the apocalypse cannot stop my quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. But first, a little bit of channel business. Some of you may have noticed this sound in some of my recent videos. And you may be wondering, why is that? Have I finally gone soft? Well, yes and no, let me explain. It seems the advertisers on YouTube are getting jumpier every day and the dark cloud of demonetization looms over us all. It's up there. And I assure you, it ain't pretty. So to avoid the dark cloud of demonetization, going forward, I am going to try to keep everything as PG-13 as possible. And if we're going by standard PG-13 rules, that means I am allowed one uncensored F-bomb. So every once in a while, you may still hear an uncensored instance of the word fuck. Like that. That right there. That was my one. And I just wasted it on the intro. Great. Well, poor planning on my part. Sorry. So now if I say fuck again, yep, there it is. Fuck. 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 Can't say fuck anymore. But PG-13 does still allow me to say words like ass, damn, shit, cunt, well... Maybe not cunt, that one's pretty bad. Probably not cock either. And definitely no racial or homophobic slurs, although that's not really something I do anyway. I'm not exactly known for my heated gaming moments, so I don't think that's going to be a problem unless I end up talking about Blazing Saddles again. But otherwise, this will continue to be the same show you know and tolerate. Now that that's out of the way, let's get on to the shitty-ass subject of today's goddamn review, Color of Night. Directed by Richard Rush, Color of Night is an erotic thriller, yep, another one of those, starring Bruce Willis and Jane March in the lead roles. Oh great, a movie where the hero is banging a girl half his age. Yep, another one of those. Granted, it is not as bad as the age gap in Ghosts Can't Do It, but we are still pretty firmly in Oh Dear God Why territory. And the supporting cast features Ruben Blades, Leslie Ann Warren, Brad Dourif, Lance Henriksen, Scott Bakula, Kevin J. O'Connor. Wow, there's like actual talent in this movie. Maybe it won't be so bad, thought the critic before sitting down to watch the movie and immediately realizing his mistake. The movie had a $40 million budget, somehow, and only managed to bring in about half that at the box office. And of course, it won the Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Picture. But here's the thing about that. Color of Night was nominated in nine categories out of 11. The other two were Worst New Star and Worst Remake or Sequel, and it wasn't eligible for those. But despite nine nominations, it somehow won Worst Picture without winning any other awards. This has not happened before or since, and I am not even going to try to make sense of that. I think we've established by now that making sense of the Razzies is an exercise in futility but I am going to try to make sense of this movie. Although, that will also be tricky, and to explain why, we have to dive into the movie's troubled production. Richard Rush was hired to work on the film by producer Andrew Vina, one of the founders of the now-defunct Carol Co. Pictures, though by 1994 he had founded the now-defunct Synergy Pictures. Suffice to say, he had his ups and downs. Rush had a bad experience with Vina on another film, but decided to take the job because he liked Color of Night's story. Perhaps he should have listened to his instincts. First, he had trouble with Bruce Willis, who would pull other actors aside and coach them on how to do their scenes in a way that he thought would be good for his character, which was often contrary to what Rush wanted. Second, Willis' friend Carmine Zazora, who worked with Willis on several of his movies, was an associate producer. Two months after he met Jane March, he married her, and then became very demanding with regards to her work in the film, setting more favorable hours and whatnot. And if you're wondering, no, their marriage did not last, but that's Hollywood for you. Ultimately, these turned out to be minor setbacks. Rush could and did get past that. But then principal photography wrapped and it was time to edit the film. And this is where Rush and Vina butted heads. Because they both had completely different ideas of how the film should be cut. And according to Vina, Rush's contract did not give him final cuts to which he was accustomed. But Rush was not about to back down, contracts be damned, and he insisted he should still have final cut because he shot the film and damn it, he knew better. Ultimately, Vina and Rush each produced and test screened their own cuts of the film so audiences could decide which one was better. 
Who won this little competition depends on who you ask. Regardless, neither man was willing to concede and their spat became very public. Eventually, Vina had enough and fired Rush, and coincidentally, Rush suffered a heart attack a few days later, though he recovered. At this point, the Directors Guild finally intervened and said, Nuh-uh, asshole, you can't fire a director that late into post-production. So Rush was rehired, and with the Guild now moderating the dispute, he and Vina finally came to an arrangement. Vina's cut would be released to theaters, and Rush's cut would be released to home video. Nowadays, something like that isn't all that weird. Different cuts of films get released to home video all the time. But back then, this was unprecedented. And this is why reviewing this movie will be a little tricky because there are two different versions. Well, technically there are four. There was an international theatrical cut that restored some of the material cut from the American release, and I think this got a DVD release in Italy, but I'm not going to waste my time trying to track that down. And somewhere out there is an unrated cut, though the differences between that and the R-rated director's cut are reportedly minimal. So we're only going to focus on the American theatrical cut and the director's cut. And thanks to a recent Blu-ray release, the theatrical cut is finally available to watch for probably the first time since it face-planted in theaters all those years ago. As previously established, I will buy anything. So, let's see if we can make any sense of this at all. I don't know about you, but I'm not holding my breath. The story is pretty much the same between the two versions. Willis plays Dr. Bill Kappa, PhD, a psychologist who witnesses a patient commit suicide right in front of him by jumping out a window. The windows in this movie are not very sturdy. He's so traumatized by the incident that he loses the ability to see the color red. More on that later. Facing an incredible amount of guilt, not to mention a lawsuit from the family of the deceased, he leaves his practice in New York and visits a fellow psychologist in Los Angeles, Bob Moore, played by Bakula, who runs a weekly group therapy session with five people who have various mental problems. Sandra, kleptomaniac and nymphomaniac. Because it's an erotic thriller, so of course there's a nymphomaniac. Casey, sadomasochist. Clark, OCD. Buck, PTSD from witnessing the murder of his wife and daughter, and Richie, who has a stutter and a gender identity crisis. And as soon as they mention this character had a gender identity crisis, the impact of my sphincter slamming shut could be measured on the Richter scale, because what are the chances that a movie made in the mid-90s is going to handle this topic well? Well, you would be surprised. Because here's the thing. The people in this therapy group are all pretty horrible, and they are horrible to each other. They have no self-awareness whatsoever and will make fun of each other's problems without hesitation. But Richie's gender identity struggles are never presented as a negative. The group has no problem making fun of his stutter, but when he says there are times when he wishes he were a woman, they're all pretty cool with it. On top of that, Sandra is finding out she might be bisexual and even has a girlfriend. No one seems to have a problem with that either. Not what I expected from a movie made in 1994. But it turns out Richie's gender identity crisis is not what it seems because... Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Bob has been getting some threatening messages and suspects one of his group may be behind it. Bill, it turns out, is improbably good at reading people. Sherlock here somehow figures out their entire life stories from that one group meeting, but he doesn't think any of them are killers. Isn't that interesting? But someone is definitely a killer because Bob bites the big one. Again, the windows, not so sturdy. At this point, Bill takes over the therapy group at their insistence and also has some one-on-one -on -one meetings with each of them, except Richie, who he's somehow unable to track down. Isn't that interesting? But he does meet Richie's brother Dale, who wants Richie to be taken out of therapy, despite it being court-mandated. And he is incredulous when Bill refuses. Isn't that interesting? We'll come back to that. Two more people come into Bill's life after Bob's murder. One is Police Lieutenant Hector Martinez, played by Ruben Blades, who makes it abundantly clear he does not like Dr. Kappa. I mean, he despises him, and it's hilarious. One day, Bill goes to check the mail, or rather, Bob's mail, because I guess he's just living in Bob's Malibu mansion now. I guess Bob made a killing on a book deal, and... <laughs> killing. And now Bill gets to reap the benefits. To be fair, I don't hear Bob complaining. And Bob's killer is apparently not done because he tries to off Bill by putting a rattlesnake in the mailbox. And this is Martinez's reaction when he hears the news. <laughs> a 
rattlesnake. Oh my God, who reacts like that? No fear, no sympathy, just finds the whole thing hilarious. Blades is amazing in this movie. His character is such a raging asshole, but he's so entertaining. And the other person Bill meets is Rose, played by Jane Marsh, when she rear ends his car. Or rather, Bob's car. Did Bob just leave him everything in his will? It's fine if he did, it was just never established. And she henceforth refers to herself as the old fender bender, which amuses Martinez to no end. That's a very young girl to be going around fending benders. I don't know if that's how the line was written or if Blades made a legitimate mistake and they just went with it, but I do love his delivery when he says, fending benders. He really is the highlight of this movie. And despite the age gap, ew, they soon begin their sexual relationship. And that's about all I can show you without getting demonetized. Suffice to say, there is a lot of nudity in this movie from both Willis and March. And in the director's cut, you do get to see Bruce's Willis for about half a second. And you get to see most of Jane March for significantly more than half a second. Over the course of the film, Bill survives several more attempts on his life before the killer's identity is finally revealed. And if you were paying attention to my not-so-subtle hints, you probably figured out it's Dale. But that's not all. There's another big reveal, though I'm not sure it counts as a reveal when they don't really seem to be trying to hide it. And it all starts when we meet Sandra's girlfriend, Bonnie. I mean, it's not just me, right? This is painfully obvious. The makeup and the wig aren't fooling anyone. The funny thing is, Rose has a tattoo on her ass of, what else, a rose, and the movie actually goes to the trouble of pointing out Bonnie has the same tattoo on her ass. My god, could it be that these two women who have the exact same voice, body, and facial structure are actually the same person? Nah, that'd be too obvious. And it gets weirder. It turns out everyone in the group, except Richie, has also been dating Bonnie. And so was Bob before he died. And when everyone finds this out, Martinez cannot believe it. And quite frankly, neither can I. I mean, how does one date five people at once? There just aren't enough hours in the day. Does she not work? So like I said, Richie is the only one not dating Rose, and if you take a closer look, you can probably figure out why that is. And even if you don't figure out Richie's identity right away, it's pretty clear this person is wearing some sort of prosthetics. The first time I saw Richie, I didn't immediately know what was up, but it was obvious something was up. And sure enough, Bill eventually figures out Richie is in fact Rose. Wow, he took off the wig and glasses and the prosthetics magically disappeared. Forget the killer's identity, that is the movie's real mystery. And after Martinez shows up out of nowhere to try to arrest Dale, and Dale tries to kill everyone with a nail gun, I know that's not how nail guns work, but just pretend. Rose scores the headshot and Bill just barely stops her from committing suicide. And he finally recovers from his colorblindness and they all live happily ever after. Except Martinez, who is apparently still nailed to the wall. I don't know about you, but I would totally watch a movie that was just Reuben Blades solving crimes and yelling at people. So that's the story in a nutshell. I wouldn't say it's a bad story necessarily, but I was a bit surprised by how the movie handled its big reveals. I thought it did a pretty good job of planting just enough seeds to hint at Dale being the killer without completely giving it away. But with Rose slash Bonnie slash Richie, it seemed like they didn't even try. Hell, reportedly, March did not originally wear the prosthetics for the Richie scenes. They added them later once someone pointed out Richie's identity was way too obvious without them. They also lowered her voice to make her sound more masculine. But even with these changes, I'm guessing most people figured it out. I will grant you the identity of Rosanchi is not the main focus of the story. This is a whodunit after all, and the most important reveal in any whodunit is of course the identity of the killer. But if you're going to give away a big reveal before the big reveal, what was the point? The movie also suffers from everyone is an asshole syndrome, especially with regards to the therapy group. And I could deal with that if they were at least entertaining, but the only entertaining asshole in the movie is Martinez. Everyone else is just a jerk. And there are some moments where the movie just flat out ignores the laws of physics. At one point, the as yet unidentified killer goes after Bill in a red Pontiac Firebird. In this shot, Bill hits the brakes to avoid being rammed, so the Firebird is now in front. But in the next shot, Bill is in front. 
Did Dale figure out how to teleport? Actually, he probably did because during the final confrontation in Dale's shop, Bill and Rose try to run away from him, but a second later, he's magically in front of them and driving a goddamn forklift. He has to be a teleporter. Space is warped and time is bendable. It gets even dumber when Dale tries to kill Bill, haha, ha, no, by dropping a car on him from atop a parking garage. Here's the problem. Bill is walking right along the edge of the garage on the lower level, and Dale is all the way up on the top floor. How can he possibly see him from up there? So he's a teleporter with X-ray vision. Are there any other superpowers we don't know about? Well, anyway, to fully examine how Color of Night went horribly wrong, we need to get into the differences between the producer's cut and the director's cut. While the story, characters, and lack of understanding of the laws of space and time are consistent between the two, Vina did make many changes. Some of the changes don't amount to much. A few scenes use slightly different takes, some of the nudity and sex was altered, likely to secure an R rating, the score is different due to scenes having different lengths between the two cuts, and the color grading is different, although that may just be the transfer, I'm not sure. But some of the changes Vina made, small as they may be, significantly affect the film. What I found after watching both cuts is Rush had a pretty clear picture of the story he wanted to tell. It wasn't the best story and it had some mistakes, but it was at least coherent and competently told overall. Every setup had a payoff and it all flowed very well. Vina, however, either gave no shits about the story Rush was trying to tell, or just plain didn't get it. The result is a lot of plot threads that were left hanging or weren't resolved very well. For example, after Bob is killed, Lieutenant Martinez insists Bill should be the one to tell the group about Bob's death and flat out refuses to do it himself. And he continues to hound Bill about this until he finally relents and not only tells the group about Bob's death, but takes over for him. It turns out there was a reason for this, as Officer Anderson, played by Eric LaSalle, reveals. Remember Buck, whose wife and daughter were tragically murdered? Turns out he used to be a cop and worked with Martinez. And Martinez had an affair with his wife. Yikes. But surprisingly, when Kappa confronts Martinez about his deception, Buck defends the angry detective and reveals he forgave Martinez long ago. I never got the chance to forgive her. So I forgave him instead. That is a genuinely beautiful moment. Too bad it's not in Vinus Cut. In the theatrical version, the affair is never mentioned at all. In fact, Officer Anderson is barely in the movie. The scene where Kappa confronts Martinez is still there, but with all the references to the affair cut out, it looks like he's only mad because Martinez never told him Buck was a cop. Who cares if he's a cop? Without the affair, that detail is completely inconsequential, so the argument is pointless. Vina also changed the order of a few scenes, which creates a problem in one particular instance. Bill learns Richie and Dale were previously treated by a Dr. Needlemeyer who has since passed away. In the theatrical cut, he visits the doctor's widow and asks about Richie, and she does not respond well. You get out of here before I call the police! This is Needlemeyer. Get out of here! Well, she seems nice. Later on, Bill visits Dale's shop to talk about Richie, and it never occurs to him to ask about Mrs. Needlemeyer's reaction to Richie's name. Why would he not bring that up? Well, there's actually a very good reason. In the director's cut, those scenes are in the opposite order. First he visits Dale, and then Mrs. Needlemeyer. And what, at first glance, may seem like an insignificant change makes Dr. Kappa, PhD, look like a complete moron. Vina also cut out a few details about Bob, like his album of risque photos, which, of course, I can't show you. Later in the film, Rose realizes the album could put her in a compromising position because at least one photo is of her, and she attempts to swipe them, but Bill catches her in the act. This scene is still in the theatrical cut, but now we don't know what she's taking or why she's taking it. And there's more. Bill follows her and gets her plate number, but in the theatrical cut, he never actually does anything with this information. It's never mentioned again. In the director's cut, he talks to Anderson and says he got a plate number of someone who dinged his car in a parking lot, and Anderson agrees to help track her down. But seeing through Bill's ruse, he gives the number to Martinez, who finds out the car is Dale's. And thus, he actually has a reason to show up at Dale's shop in the nick of time. Man, Eric LaSalle really got the shaft. Almost all of his scenes were cut. But at least the black dude doesn't die in this movie. And remember that car chase with the Firebird? Well, in the director's cut, Dale calls Bill on his car phone and, disguising his voice, taunts him before he tries to kill him. Look around. 
can't you see me? I'm in the red car. And if you recall, Bill cannot see the color red. So he knows Dale is somewhere nearby, but he can't spot him, and it rightly freaks him out. But in the theatrical cut, Dale's line about being in the red car is omitted. Despite this, after hanging up, Bill immediately hits the gas as if he knows Dale is nearby. But he has no reason to suspect this. These are just some of the questionable changes Vina made in the theatrical cuts. I'm not going to list everything he did wrong, because honestly, if I do that, we'll be here all day. Suffice to say, I understand why this movie was critically panned upon release. Vina's cut is a mess, and with all the hanging plot threads that were never resolved, it feels unfinished. All this being said, not all of Vina's changes were bad. Take the opening scenes, for example. The film begins with a look at Dr. Kappa's patient before she commits suicide, as she appears to be having a nervous breakdown in her apartment. We briefly see her put a gun in her mouth, and then we fade into her session with Kappa. But in the director's cut, after she puts the gun in her mouth, she starts fellating it. She is definitely an NRA member. And when she jumps out of the window, her fall to the ground is shorter in Vina's version. It's only a difference of a few seconds, but what a difference those few seconds make. Her fall in Rush's version seems comically long. Allegedly, during a test screening, the audience actually started giggling at this moment. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that's not the reaction Rush was hoping for. Also, in the director's cut, there are several moments where Bruce Willis starts narrating when Rose either arrives or leaves. And I don't mean a voiceover, I mean Bill Kappa actually starts narrating to himself for no reason. Vina cut most of this out, and I agree with this decision because that narration was really stupid. Vina also cut a scene where Kappa visits what I assume is the state records department and finds Richie's files. This scene is present in Rush's cut, but its presence actually creates a huge plot hole. Here's the thing. We know Richie is actually Rose, but once upon a time, Dale and Rose actually had a brother named Richie. He committed suicide after years of abuse by Dr. Needlemeyer, and, not being able to cope with the loss of his brother, Dale went crazy and forced Rose to become the new Richie. This led to Rose developing a sort of multiple personality disorder. The problem is, Bill doesn't learn about the death of the real Richie, or that Rose was Dale's sister until much later in the film when he visits Mrs. Needlemeyer a second time. But he had access to all of Richie's records. How the hell did the state of California A, not know Richie was dead, and B, not know he had a sister? I smell bullshit. So in the end, both versions have their issues and their bright spots, but Rush's cut is clearly the superior version of Color of Night, and it's not even close. It's not a masterpiece by any stretch, but at least it's watchable. At least it resembles a finished film. I can't say that about Vina's cut, and I totally understand the Worst Picture nomination. But did it deserve to win? I'm gonna say no, considering one of the other nominees was North. Yeah, remember this one, where a young Elijah Wood played a kid named North who decides his parents don't pay him enough attention so he divorces them and goes off in search of new, better parents? Considering it's a Rob Reiner film and has a stellar cast, which coincidentally also includes Bruce Willis, you'd think it would have at least been decent. You'd be wrong. The story is terrible, the premise is ridiculous, none of the jokes land, and I mean none of them. Not a one. And literally all North does in the movie is bounce around from one ethnic stereotype to another. This was painful to watch, but somehow it didn't take home a single Razzie. How is that even possible? The Stinkers Bad Movie Awards named it the worst picture of 1994, Siskel and Ebert did likewise. In fact, North was the subject of one of Roger Ebert's more infamous reviews in which he stated he hated, 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 hated this movie. He was too kind. And yet the Golden Raspberry Foundation thought Color of Night was worse? Were they high? The theatrical cut was indeed a bad movie, but in the end, it's really just your typical bad erotic thriller. They were a dime a dozen in the 90s. I really don't get how anyone could have thought it was bad enough to win Worst Picture. It was nowhere near as bad as North. North is one of the worst movies I've ever seen, and everyone involved is bad and should feel bad. I mean, they had Kathy Bates and Abe Vigoda playing Inuits. Oh yeah, they went there. 
As for the director's cut of Color of Night, it is at least watchable, but it's not really good enough for me to recommend going out of your way to see it. If you subscribe to a streaming platform that has it in their rotation, go for it, but I wouldn't spend any money on it. The behind-the-scenes drama was plenty entertaining, but the movie itself is just... meh. Well, I guess that could have gone worse. It was relatively painless and an interesting footnote in cinema history. Wonder what's on the docket for next month. Let's see. That would be the worst picture of 1995. And that... <coughs> <coughs>